praise you today. We came to praise you, Father, because we love you. We magnify your holiness, your godliness. We magnify who you are. And Father God, we praise you for loving us enough to wake us up this morning and place on our minds and our hearts to come into your temple to worship you. Father God, we worship you with honor and with praise. We lift up our hands and our voices in thanksgiving and say, Father, thank you for everything that you have done. We ask you now, Lord, to anoint this service. Let your Holy Spirit be with us. Let us be able to worship you freely, Lord, free like you died on Calvary for us. And we just praise you and love you, Lord. In the precious name of Jesus the Christ, we ask your Holy Spirit to come in and anoint everything that's in here. Amen. Good morning, saints. Good morning. Will all those who are able to stand please stand for the reading of God's holy word. Our scripture this morning is coming from 1 Samuel 17 chapter. I will begin reading at the 41st verse through verse 50. First Samuel, 17 chapter. <clears throat> and the Philistine came on and drew near unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him for he was but a youth and ruddy, and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beast of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield, but I come to thee 
in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcels of the hosts of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with swords and spears, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David. And David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Yeah. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that, he, that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistines with the sling and with the stone and smote the Philistines and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David, the word of God for the people of God, from all that dwells before the sky.
you to know we serve an awesome God. A God that reigns. mistake about it 
we know you're awesome. There's no misunderstanding. We know that you are the source and the strength of life. We are not confused about the fact that we need you at all times. And we understand that if you turn your back towards us, that we have no other resource that can come into our lives and bless us the way you bless us. So we are real with you this morning. Yes, we have some faultiness about us. Yes, we have some weakness within us. Yes, we have not arrived to perfection. Yes, we slip and we slide. Even so, you promised us that you would never leave us nor forsake us and that you have somebody as our intercessor whose name is Jesus who's interceding right now on our behalf. We, we have some issues in our own lives. We, we're not looking over the fence into somebody else's yard. We, we want you to stay right here in our yard. We, we, we have some concerns. We, we, we have some needs. We have some troubles. We have some decisions to make. We, 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 we have some enemies. We, 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 we have some health challenges. We, we, we just have some problems that we can't solve on our own merit. So, so we are appealing to you right now who we know is a healer and a deliverer and a sustainer and a mind regulator and one who moves on his own who governs this world by the blinking of his eye so God we are appealing to you now and all we are saying is help us this morning just 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 help us you you, you know who we are you know where we live you know our trials our circumstances you, 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 you know our weaknesses and, and our strengths and, and you know what we can do and what we cannot do. But in the midst of our weaknesses and what we cannot do, we, we know that you know how to build a bridge over troubled waters. We, we, we know that, that you know how to deliver us from our enemies and, and, and we know that you can sit right next to us in our cubicles, on our jobs, where we are stressed out and, and pushed to the limits of our, of our own human ability. But, but you're there to refresh us, to start us over again. We thank you, Lord, because some of us, some of us need some peace in our spirit this morning. We, we need some joy in our lives this morning, Father. Father, we need you to come by and just visit with us on our pew seat where we are. 
and, 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 just, and just calm us down for a moment and cause a ceasefire and let us, let us just have an exhale moment and, and let us experience God, your, your, your presence in our lives right now. Help us this morning, Lord. We, we need some help. We, we, we may walk like we bad. We may talk like we tough. We may act like we got all together. But on the inside, you know we ain't got our stuff together. And we need you this morning in a special way. We're we taking off the facade right now. And, and, and we don't mind telling you, Lord, help us, help us, help us, help us, help us. We need some help this morning, Father. Father, I stretch my hands to you right now. Sweep this place and give us the assurance and confidence that we need this morning. That's going to be all right. That it's going to be all right. Help us to lean on that word that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Help us this morning to let us know that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. We speak against the, all of the influences and all of the pulling of the devil who's trying to convince us and speak to our mind that we cannot do this. We cannot endure this. We cannot overcome this. We cannot be able to jump over this. But God, we believe that if you hold us with your righteous hand and if you just be there with us, we will overcome because we are more than conquerors. Christ Jesus, my Lord Jesus, we ask you one more special request. Would you please take care of our children? I, I mean, Lord, would you build a fence all around them? Lord, would you take care of our child, our grandchild? Would you, would you watch over them in this crazy world that they live in and we live in? Would you, would you help them, protect them as they trying to find themselves and trying to make decisions, God, and, and being influenced by the wrong crowd? We, we're asking you, God, that you will not allow the devil to take their soul, Lord. We are praying for our children this morning. We are praying, God, that you would just be right there with them. Hear our prayer over our children. Our our grandchildren and our great grandchildren God will you please watch over them and then Lord would you give us a shout in our soul this morning I mean would you give us a shout down in the deep reservoir of our soul this morning will you, will you, will you help us would you help us to just give you a praise and, and let you know that, that we are grateful people. Give, give us a shout this morning to say, Lord, I just thank you for waking me up this morning. I, I thank you that I started out in my right mind. I, I thank you that my bed was not my cooling bed. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for the rising of the sun and the setting of the same. I, I thank you that I got a roof over my head. I, I thank you I got food to eat and I, I thank you I got strength in my body that I can put one foot in front of the other. I thank you, God, that I got a mind to think and I know where I am this morning. I thank you, God, that you put family and friends in my life. I, I thank you, God, for my journey. I, I thank you, God, for all your blessing. I thank you, God, for my healing. I thank you, God, for my deliverance. I thank you, God, for picking me up. I thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy. I thank you, God, for your protection, your provision. I thank you, God, for being there when I needed you the most. I, I thank you, God, for watching all over me. I thank you, God, put a shout down in our bosom to give you the praise for all the great things you have done in our life, not just today, but yesterday, in the days before. Give us a praise. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to say hallelujah. Somebody ought to say praise the Lord. Somebody ought to say thank you. Hallelujah. Glory. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, tell me where would I 
Like you mean it. Say it that the other person can hear you saying it. Hey.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you know he's real? Whoa. Because you know he really lives on the inside of you. You are his dwelling place. I thank God for his mercy, his grace, his loving kindness for his son, Jesus Christ. For the Holy Spirit, who's our comforter, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and standby. Thank God for our pastor, Pastor Wright. You're such a blessing to us, sir. You and Sister Jennifer, you're a blessing. And we appreciate your prayers. Maybe we don't say that enough, but just appreciate you praying for us. Appreciate my sisters in the gospel and, and the officers and members of this church. Everybody that's visiting, guess what? You're only a visitor like two seconds because this is your father's house. So welcome home. Welcome home. You know, it's, uh, I, I was sitting there and it was hard to hold my brakes. My brakes were slipping. Y'all, it, was just, it was just fired up. You know, Pastor Wright was praying and it was so powerful because he, he asked the question, uh, in his prayers he said, some of us have problems we can't fix ourselves. Anybody here got a problem you can't fix yourself? Got a problem you can't fix yourself? Amen. And then he said, you know, Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Now, some of you didn't applaud and didn't raise your hand because you were concerned about the person sitting by you, that if you raise your hand, they were going to ask you, well, what's your problem? But that's okay. I think you might have just moved your eyelid a little bit higher or patted your foot. But, you know, one, one of the things that, that God's placed on my heart, we, the scripture was read and, and read extremely well about David. And we're going to look at David, but if you would, before we look at that, would you turn over to Ephesians, the third chapter? Ephesians, the third chapter and, and the 20th verse. I do believe those things that we can't solve ourselves are giants that are in our lives. That God wants us to conquer. He wants us to have victory, be victorious over them. But, you know, a lot of times we study about what David did. We talked about what David did, but... I don't know about you, I, I was in a, in, a, in a class yesterday with some 40-something men and some of us that are something, not 40-something, but we're a little bit older. And, you know, I had to confess to the, to the instructor, I'm, I'm just a why kind of guy. If you tell me something, I'm going to ask you why. And I'm not challenging you, but if I don't understand why, I can't act on it. Sometimes I believe we study about David and we see what he did victoriously, but we don't understand the why and what caused it to happen, what was behind it. So really, we're going to spend some time just looking behind the curtain. You remember The Wizard of Oz, right? That old movie that I didn't even know they had a yellow brick road, Pastor, because we had a black and white TV. Okay? But, you know, someone in that scene, they pulled the curtain back, and she saw there was just a man back there moving little stuff around. So we're just going to ask God to help us pull the curtain back to see what's there. So Ephesians, the, the third chapter and, and the 20th verse. Ephesians, the third chapter and the, and the 20th verse. Here's what it says. It says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. And that kind of sounds like that first song we heard, right? My God is an awesome God. Sounds like that, that first song that we heard. My God's an awesome God. What I want us to do, though, is just take a minute and look a little bit deeper at that. And there are some other translations I'd like for you to consider. And I'm just going to look at the first part of that verse, because it's, it's something to shout about. That first part says, now unto him, talking about God, this is King James, that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. How many of you want to see God do in your life exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think? You want God just to blow your mind away. Here's what it says in the, the NIV version. It says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask, or imagine. You get that? He can do immeasurably more. You can't even measure it. More than you can ask, and you can't even imagine it. The NLT says, Now all glory to God, who is able to accomplish infinitely 
more than we might ask or think. It's boundless, infinitely more. And then the message translation, this is the last one we're going to look at. It says, God can do anything, you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dream. Wow. Isn't he an awesome God? He's an awesome God. He's an awesome God. Now, now one of the things that, that, that's something to get excited about. But you know, when the Spirit of God placed it on my heart, what he said was, it's something that we should shout about and praise God about. But you know, some of us don't get excited about it and don't shout about it. We don't do that because we're thinking, if God can do all that, then why isn't, it, why isn't this giant in my life gone? If God can do all that, why am, I not, why am I not living exceedingly abundantly above all that I can ask or think? I tell you, I'm a why kind of guy, right? But you know, God can do all that. Is he angry with me? Why have I, I prayed for this thing? I've been believing for this thing, but it hadn't happened yet. I'm a Christian. I give my tithes gladly. I serve in the church, but this giant just won't go away. I'm looking for the exceedingly abundantly above, but apparently it doesn't know my address. I've seen it skip over to my neighbor on one side who looks like they got what they got by lying and cheating. They got blessed, but what about me, Lord? Now, y'all probably don't ask those kind of questions out loud. <laughs> but, you know, I believe the secret to what's going on is in the second part of that verse. Let's look at the second part of the verse. The second part of the verse says, I'm talking about the King James, it says, according to the power that worketh in us. God will do exceedingly abundantly above all that I ask or think according to the power that's working in me. Now some of you got that, but you know, I looked up that word, that phrase, according to. Here's what according to is. According to is defined as depending on. It's, de it's defined as in agreement with. It's defined as consistent with. It's defined as on the authority of. It's defined as in proportion to. It's defined as contingent on. Well, what are you saying? God can only do in my life what's the line with his power that flows in my life. You see, if I've got little power, I'll have little blessings. You know, what God dealt with me on is, sometimes I would sit around and say, I'm waiting on God. Yeah, I prayed, then I go take my seat. And I wait for God to do something. You know what I found out? God was waiting on me. He said, son, what you need to do is use the power I've given you to impact the change you want to see. He'll do exceedingly, abundantly above all that you ask or think, depending on, in agreement with, consistent with, on the authority of, in proportion to, continuing on, the power that works in you. That's what's going to make the difference. See, God loves you so much, he gave his son for you. The Bible says, he who freely delivered his son up for you, how shall he not with him give you all things? God's got all things to give you. He's just waiting for you to stir up, to use the power that he's already placed in you to receive it. See, giants in your life don't come to destroy you. They come to challenge you to use what God's already given you. 
You don't know how much weight you can lift until you pick up a barbell and start pressing it. And when you hit the wall, it's just tearing down muscles so you can lift more. So that's the backdrop of, of what went on with David. So really what we're going to talk about for a little bit is use the power. Use the power. Sometimes we're looking for more power. The best way to get more power is to use the power you've got. Use the power. Use the power that God has given you already so that he can manifest in your lives the things that he's already promised to do. Now the first question might be, what power has God given me? That's a fair question. I tell you I was a wide kind of guy, right? What power has he given me? The Bible clearly says that when you made Jesus, well, really, before we go there, if you haven't made Jesus the Lord of your life, you got no power. The Bible clearly says you're without God, having no hope in this world. Aliens to the covenant of promise. That's what it says about you. Sometimes people will look and say, well, I'm just getting what I deserve. I learned not to say that because if I got what I deserve, I'd go to hell. We might as well just cut to the chase, huh? No, I'm getting what God has graciously given me, and that's life. But he wants me to have life more abundantly. So if you haven't made Jesus the Lord of your life, I would not leave here today without making Jesus my Lord and Savior. But if you made Jesus your Lord and Savior... The Bible says that when you made Jesus your Lord and Savior, the Holy Ghost came to live on the inside of you. That's the power that you have. Acts, the 10th chapter, and the 38th verse says, How God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. God has given you his very power on the inside of you so that you can manifest victories on the outside of you. Sometimes we walk in life like we've got a power outage. You know, it's one thing if, I don't know who your utility company is, it's one thing if, if a storm comes and the power lines are down and you're in the dark. It's another one when you've got power in your house and you won't turn on the light switch and then complain about the darkness. He's given you his Holy Spirit who lives within you. Now, sometimes we as Christians wonder about that. We say, well, what do you mean? Romans, the eighth chapter, and the ninth verse says this, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you, now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. I didn't write that. It's in your Bible. What it's clearly saying is if you don't have the Holy Ghost living in you, you ain't God's. Y'all were quiet on that one. Well, maybe you'll like this one better. 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and the 16th verse says this. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. That word dwells says the Holy Ghost lives in you. That Holy Ghost is not there just to make you feel good. Even though he is a comforter, he's there to empower you to be able to do what God's called you to do. He's there to empower you so that God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think according to that power that lives in you. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said in John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have life more abundantly. That more abundantly there is tied to God doing exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think. But you've got to use the power that's in you. Unfortunately, some of us as Christians are like Lazarus. We get born again but we're still wrapped in grave clothes. 
which means we aren't using the power. We aren't even fit for the master's use. That's why Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Loose him and let him go. God wants you loose and let go so that you will be a testimony of him to the world so they'll see the power and the glory that he's manifested in your life. God wants to bless you so great till other people will be jealous of you and fall in love with the Savior that you serve. I know this, who was that, was it Bobby Womack that talked about Harry Hippie? See, y'all don't know about Harry Hippie, right? His, the lady name was, what, Mary? She was panhandling pennies just to feed Harry's baby. Some of us want God to not only provide for us, but we want to treat him like we're hairy hippie. We just want to lounge around and do nothing. We're almost like the farmer that sits on the porch looking for a harvest and hasn't planted a seed. You know, it's always interesting when I hear people say, well, I put in church what I can afford to put in. Okay. Well, God's got a definition for that. You're robbing God. That one didn't go along too well either, right? <laughs> but you know, if I want financial seed, I need, to fo- I need to sow. If I want a financial return, I need to sow financial seed. I need to believe God knew what he was talking about when he told me to give the tithe and then above that give offering. So, so in looking at it, the Spirit of God lives in us. So, so what do I have to do to, to use the power of God Now we're going to look at David for a few minutes. You know, the first thing that I've got to do to use the power God has placed on the inside of me so I can have exceedingly abundantly above all that I ask or think, I've got to know God's promise. I've got to know what God has promised me. See, if I don't know what he's promised me, I will never go after it. I will settle for whatever I get. If I don't know what God's promised me, then I will not stretch with my hope so that my faith can bring to pass what I'm hoping for based on his word. You know, the Bible says something very unique in the the message translation about Abraham. What it says was when there was no hope, Abraham, 100 years old, body wasn't functioning. God kept telling him, you're going to have a baby. Matter of fact, change his name from Abram to Abraham, father of many nations. You see this old man walking around telling people, I'm the father of many nations. People say, yeah, right, huh? But the Bible said when all hope was taken away, what Abraham decided to do was to live based on what God said, not based on what he couldn't do. Did you get that? Abraham said, I'm no longer going to live based on what I can't do. I'm going to live based on what God said he would do. He knew what God's promise was. David knew what God's promise was. David had promised the children of Israel in Deuteronomy. He said, there shall no man be able to stand before you. I don't care if he's 10 foot tall in the form of Goliath. No man will stand before you. He told Joshua the same thing. So David knew the promises. If you will look at at 1 Samuel 17 chapter, 1 Samuel 17 chapter in the 8th verse. 1 Samuel 17 chapter and the 8th verse. 1 Samuel 17 chapter in the 8th verse. The 8th verse says this, And he, Goliath, stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set battle in array? Am I not a Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. This giant came to him 40 days in a row, morning and evening. And he basically said, man up. He said, man up. I'm a Philistine. You're a servant of Saul. You're in God's army, man up. Send somebody out here to fight me. I believe the world is is offering that challenge to every man that's here. Man up. It's important that you provide for your families 
physically, it's also important that you provide for them emotionally and spiritually. It's important that you become three-dimension men, not one-dimension. But Goliath was saying, send me a man. Every time he would come out, King Saul and the men of Israel would fall away because they were afraid. They would fall away. Wow, Lord, I don't know. They would fall away. It almost reminds me sometimes of how brothers hide behind their wives. Brothers, don't hate me. Y'all love me. I know y'all love me, so we're going to be okay. I ain't talking about you if you ain't doing it. But here's a true confession. There's some things I hide behind my wife on that I don't want to deal with. She doesn't let me get away with it too often. But they would fall away. You know, look at that 26th verse. And David spake to the man, to the men that stood by him. He said, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach, the criticism of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of God? David went straight to covenant promise. He said, look, this joker's riding around here defying God's army. He's criticizing God's army, and he doesn't even have a covenant with God. He doesn't have a covenant with God. I dare him to do it. He doesn't have a right to do this. Here's the message. Whatever that giant is you're dealing with in your life, ask a simple question. Is this in line with God's promise to me based on the covenant? Is this in line or in agreement with what God has promised me in his word? And if it's not, you need to fight it. You need to fight it. Is this in line? I know sometimes people will say, well, you know, God gives people sickness to teach them a lesson. If I did that to my children, they would lock me up for child abuse. God doesn't do that. But a simple question, is this in line with God's promise to me? If it's not, I need to fight it. So the the key thing is, the first thing in order to use the power I've got to know the promises. I've got to know when to use power and when not. That was one of the training things we got yesterday. When do you engage? When do you not engage? The second thing, in order to use power, use the power God's given me, I must be prepared. I've got to be prepared. You know, David, when he was herding sheep, he was preparing himself to fight Goliath. Remember the 23rd Psalms? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Matter of fact, he said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. David was preparing for the battle before he got to the battle. Some of us don't prepare until we're in the middle of the battle. Everything's coming at us, and we're trying to find where we put our Bible. Well, you know, I know I used to have that app on the phone one time, but I must have, I must have deleted it. It ain't here. We've got to prepare for the battle before we're engaged in the battle. We need to be prepared. You know, the other thing David said in 27, Psalms 27, he said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? David was was prepared. David was prepared. Matter of fact, when you look at that, that in 1 Samuel 17 chapter, what David said was, look look at, at the 32nd verse. David said, this is from the NLT, don't worry about this Philistine. David, David told Saul, I will go fight him. David was a boy. David said, don't worry about this Philistine. I got it. And I get a picture. Saul, every time the man came up, Saul and all his posse started falling away. Here come this little sheep herding boy. And he said, look, hey, king, don't worry about it. I got it. 
David was ready for the challenge. But then the other thing that was interesting, Saul said, Saul looked at him and said, don't be ridiculous. You know, Saul probably said, you got to be kidding. You got to be kidding. He said, look, you're a boy, and he's been a man of war since he was a child. But then that's when David shared his testimony. David said, oh, yeah, I heard sheep. But when the bear and the lion came to take, a, take one of the sheep in his mouth and was going, I would grab it by the whiskers, by the beard, and make it let it go. And he said, if they had the nerve to turn on me, I would grab them and take a club and beat them to death. He said, just like I did them, I will do him. Here's a good message. God has given you victories in your life already. He's already allowed you to, to have, be victorious over giants. Don't forget what he's already done. When pastor was praying, toward the end of the prayer, he started praising and encouraging us to praise. See, when you start praising God for what he's already done, whatever's in front of you gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller because your God gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. David said, the same God who delivered me from the bear, the same God who delivered me from the lion will deliver me from this Philistine. Saints of God, the power is already in you. What you've got to do is use it. The other thing in preparation, David knew what his weapons were. David knew his weapons. Saul went and got his coat of armor, gave him his, his shield, his helmet, his sword, put the sword on. David must have looked like the boy that had the pants on too long. He was kind of drooping and couldn't even move. David said, look, this stuff doesn't work for me because it hadn't been tested. This has not been tried in battle. I've got to go for what I know. Saints of God, God has given you his whole armor. Are you proficient in the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness? Are your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace? Do you have the shield of faith and know how to use it? Do you know how to wield the sword of the Spirit? Tell you what, when you're facing the giant, it's too late to try to read the instructions. David said, thank you, King.